The city of Greenville was named in honor of the John Green family, which settled here in June of 1844. The Greens, John, Deborah, and their four children, were natives of New York State. Before reaching their future home in Montcalm County, they first stopped at their Denverist relative's farm in Otisco Township, Ionia County. Leaving his family there, John, Samuel Demarest, and Samuel's two sons headed north, probably following one of the Indian trails which laced the area. Among the several trails, there were two prominent ones which intersected near the present Washington Street Bridge. One came from Ionia in the south, passed through the future Greenville, and continued north through the present Lakeview. The other trail came from Saginaw. After crossing the Flat River, it led past the Indian village, located on the western bend of the river, and went northward to Pentwater. The men selected a site east of the village to erect a shanty for shelter, then constructed a dam across the river and built a sawmill. These structures were here where Franklin Street now crosses the river. With these projects completed, the men returned to Otisco, where Green retrieved his family and brought them to their new home in Eureka Township, Montcalm County. Josiah Russell joined the Greens in November and the following year, with the help of Thomas Myers, built another dam and sawmill just north of the present Fair Plain Street. Farmers soon arrived and took up land to the east, west, and south of the river. A carpenter, blacksmith, millwrights, and Dr. Thomas Green, John's brother, settled near the Green's Mill to serve the needs of the growing population. By 1850, 456 people were living in Eureka Township. To the north of the river lay a vast forest of white pine trees. At first, the trees were cut and turned into lumber for local use, as there was little profit in sending them to downriver markets. After the Civil War, demand for wood products dramatically increased. During the winter, thousands of trees were cut, hauled to the banks of the Flat River, and piled there to await the spring floods. In the spring, when the snow melted and raised the river level from the runoff, the trees were rolled into the river to be floated to the mills. White pine was a lightweight wood and floated high in the water, but occasionally a snag would occur and create a tremendous log jam. It took great skill and courage to untangle the mess, which sometimes resulted in a loss of lives. Several saw, stave, and shingle mills were located along the river in Greenville. Not all the trees were processed here, but were sent downriver to mills in Belding, Lowell, Grand Rapids, as far away as Grand Haven, and across Lake Michigan. The finished products at first were made up into rafts and floated downriver to market. After the Detroit, Lansing, and Lake Michigan Railroad came to Greenville in 1870, the finished products were shipped out by rail. The river continued to be used for floating logs out of the woods. A peak was reached in 1881 when 165 million board feet of logs passed through Greenville. Therefore, the amount decreased until the last run in 1890. With all the pine near the river having been cut, lumbermen laid tracks into the woods and hauled logs out with small trains. After the trees were gone, lumbermen sold the land to farmers who employed stump pullers to clear the land for planting. The stumps were put to use as fencing to keep the animals and deer away from the crops. Among the farmers were immigrants from Denmark who primarily settled in the Gowan area, some of whom later moved into Greenville. Their contributions to the community are honored by the annual Danish festival. The land was ideal for growing potatoes, with Greenville becoming a shipping center for the tubers. Potato storage warehouses line Lafayette Street next to the railroad tracks. With one and a half million bushels of potatoes being shipped from here each year, locals claim Greenville to be the potato capital of the world. Another prominent crop was grain. The Middleton Mill was the largest mill in Greenville, processing up to 500 barrels of wheat a day and shipping them as far away as England. Butter and eggs were also sent from here in large quantities. Farmers would bring these items to the J.T. Ridley Egg Emporium for cold storage until they would be sent out to cities in the east. Ridley, in his biography, stated he shipped 170,000 dozen eggs and 12 tons of butter a year. His warehouse is now the Flat River Historical Museum. Industry sprang up in Greenville to support the needs of the lumbermen and farmers. Several foundries were established in Greenville to make and repair sawmill and farming equipment. One of the earliest was I and T.H. Peacock Foundry, founded in 1872 at the end of East Grove Street. It was purchased in 1874 by Samuel Tower and remained in family ownership for over 100 years. 
Early products were the Gordon Howell Blast Gray and Tower Edger. In later years, the company manufactured, among other things, soda fountain equipment and the Tower Truck. The company now makes automotive stampings and is known as Tower Automotive. The Moore Plow and Greenville Implement Companies were devoted to making and repairing farm equipment. The Implement Company later diversified into manufacturing washing machines, boats, and boat motors. Of these named companies, only Tower remains in business, although no longer family owned. Calkins and Son produced barrels so Midton Mills could ship flour overseas. Ranny Refrigerator Company, founded in 1892, put to use the hardwoods which remained after the white pine was gone. The company manufactured wood refrigerators for home and commercial use. After several changes of ownership, the company is presently known as Northland Refrigeration. Skinner and Steenemann Sideboard Company began manufacturing in this city in 1904, but went bankrupt in 1909. Gibson Refrigerator Company was organized in 1908 and took over the factory the next year. It too has undergone several changes in ownership and is presently owned by Electrolux Corporation of Sweden. The Christensen Tanning and Glove Factory began business on the East Cass Street in 1904 to make use of animal hides furnished by local farmers. The company began a division of Wolverine Worldwide in 1930 and no longer has a plant here. Francis O. Lindquist began manufacturing mortar garments in the Rutan block in the early 1900s. Known as the man from Michigan, he changed his product line to men's and boys wool suits, selling them through mail order. To spur sales, a premium of a free $1 Indrasol watch was occasionally offered. He later moved the business to Grand Rapids.